Think for a second about the Muslims you've seen on TV or in the movies. What images, characters, stories come to mind? Probably, unfortunately, you immediately think of terrorist groups in the Middle East, maybe fighters in the Taliban, women in face veils, or the images of Muslim crowds burning US flags. Now, as hard as it may be to believe sometimes, those kinds of people only represent a tiny fraction of the nearly two billion Muslims across the world, almost a quarter of the world's population. The problem is you don't often see Muslim men, women and children as regular people just living their regular lives at birthday parties or weddings or going to school. And what those everyday experiences are like for Muslims, especially those living in the US. Now, a new documentary out this month on PBS tries to fill that gap. Take a look. My dad used to sit on the edge of my bed every night and recite a prayer of protection over my sister and I. My parents got calls telling them, your children will be next. That experience taught them to keep their religion and culture hidden. And the first day of class, the teacher made me stand up and tell people what it's like to be Iraqi. Like I was like this specimen, like this alien. Farouk, what a weird name. I don't know why your parents named you that. You should be Jimmy. I'm gonna call you Jimmy. I had something inside of me being like, I don't know who I am. I have to scream louder. I'm black, I'm Muslim, I'm here in order to be heard. It took years to rediscover that assertive, bold person. But every day, I choose that path of resistance. Directed by award-winning Pakistani-American director and cinematographer Nosheen Dadavoy, her documentary, An Act of Worship, paints a portrait of the last three decades of Muslim American life. News events that infamously led to spikes in Islamophobia are woven in with personal narratives and home videos of how Muslims endured and often overcame the backlash. Noshin Dadaboy, the director of An Act of Worship, joins me now to discuss her latest film. Thank you so much for coming on the show. What made you set out to make this particular film? Because you and your family are also featured in parts of it, I know. Was it something about your own personal experience growing up Muslim American that said, I got to show this to the world? Um, well, thank you so much for having me. Um, so I think there's like two kind of origins of the film. One is that um, I watched the 2016 elections with one of our producers and who, he's also Pakistani and Muslim American. And, you know, both of us were like, this next four years might be really tough for our community. So we wanted to do something about this and we set out to make this film. But part of us knowing that the those four years were going to be really tough were because of our lived experience. Like we were both in college when 9-11 happened. And for me, that's why I became a filmmaker. So the origin of this film can go back so many years where I, I wanted to become a filmmaker in order to have better representation of my community. And this film is kind of a product of that 20 years of labor to, you know, honing my craft yes. and, and, you know, getting getting to the point where I could make a project like this. And your film goes all the way back to the Iran hostage crisis of 1979, uses that major global news event to show how it affected Muslims in America as well. They faced a lot of discrimination, violence even in the wake of that. But you also highlight an event that I think a lot of people today don't realize also led to an anti-Muslim backlash. Let's have a watch. It was an act of cowardice, and it was evil. The United States will not tolerate it, and I will not allow the people of this country to be intimidated. The governor said earlier that he never gave a thought that anything like this would happen in Oklahoma. Do you chair the House Intelligence Committee? Do you ever give it a thought in your own state? Well, Larry, a month ago in New York City, I gave a speech on Islamic fundamentalism and uh, the potential for terrorism in the United States. They had arrested two or three Middle Eastern looking men. Nice. Yeah, I'm taking a picture of you. Nope, I already had one. Early in the morning, and my parents are watching the local news, and our mosque was burned down. 
Tell us about that sticky note that we saw that reads Oklahoma City bombing, because it's not just a visual device you created for the film, right? There's something behind it. Yeah, so the the post-it notes that we that kind of uh, showcase the timeline that the film highlights are one, they came out of a scene that was in the film where we have the film opens with a workshop where people are sharing personal no uh, like incidents of Islamophobia and putting them on a physical timeline. And for us, like the kind of carrying that through the film was to really help the audience understand that these policies or these like, um, you know, historical moments are not abstract and they're not academic. Like they're really landing on actual people and they're having real impact on communities. Your documentary, of course, also covers the Trump era. As we know, Trump came to office in January 2017, proclaiming his Muslim ban. And you see activists in your film campaigning against it. He may come back in January 2025. And in recent months, we've seen his attacks uh, on Jewish communities. We're seeing Trump supporters becoming more and more openly anti-Semitic. How worried are you about the future for minorities, for Muslim and Jewish communities and other communities in America if Trump returns to office in a couple of years' time? What kind of effect will that have on America and its minority communities? I think the thing that was really um, wonderful for me while making the film was seeing how much our community had changed since 9-11. So, you know, at that time, I think we didn't know how to handle a lot of the anti-Muslim backlash. And while working on the film, seeing, you know, from 2016 onward that our community had built a lot of power and had organized and knew how to advocate for themselves. And we have these young, incredible activists in the film that you see are, you know, fighting back against a lot of policies that are impacting the community. So even though they're, you know, it's scary, I do have a lot of hope. I have a lot of hope in our community and I have a lot of hope in, in the young people that we see in this film. One last question, Najin. There's another documentary that premiered in festivals not long before yours. It's called Jihad Rehab. Uh, it received a lot of backlash when it premiered at the Sundance Film Festival. And you were one of the signatories to a letter that criticized it for ethical and editorial reasons. Now, months later, it's been getting a lot of media attention for being an example of cancel culture. Uh, outlets from The New York Times uh, to here, MSNBC to Sam Harris, Megyn Kelly have all had its director on. The film shows former Guantanamo detainees in a re rehabilitation facility in Saudi Arabia. It's been criticized by former detainees, uh, by human rights activists, for several reasons, including potentially putting the subjects in danger. Others have said it's Islamophobic in its tropes. Why, in your view, is this film so problematic? And has the media gotten something wrong in its coverage of Jihad Rehab? Yeah, I mean, I think the the open letter that was initially written, you know, that I was one of the signatories of, it was very clear that the argument was about that the filmmaker was white. You know, even for me making a film about the Muslim community, um, just being Muslim didn't mean that I didn't have to do work and didn't have to understand all of the different perspectives of the people in the film. And also, you know, I think part of doing the work is ethics and making sure that the participants in the film, especially people who are as vulnerable as the men in Jihad Rehab, you know, you need to make sure that your participants feel safe in the storytelling process. And so we worked with all of our participants to make sure that they knew what the the kind of trajectory of their story would be in the film. They saw the film before it was released. We consulted with attorneys to make sure that there were no, um, you know, kind of uh, nothing harmful in the film that would impact anyone. And I also think like, there is a part of it where it is important for communities from communities to be able to tell their own stories because historically marginalized communities haven't been able to do that. Um, but what we're talking about in, in the letter is not just saying like, we're tired of war on terror stories. Cause like we're, you know, we are like, I think there's so many more stories to tell about the complex spectrum of Muslim experiences in the U S and outside of the U S. And so we're, you know, the letter was about asking our industry at large to not, you know, not just focus on, um, these war on terror stories to allow us to be able to tell our own stories. And I also think like, we've been sharing our film these last few months with Muslim audiences. And it's been so amazing to hear people say like, I feel seen and just the power of like, let allowing a community like ours, who's 
you know, largely been had uh, mass media and popular culture weaponized against them, allowing them to be seen and allowing them to feel represented is very important.